state's primary ballot, some Democrats are now calling out the decision. Plus, Harvard's embattled president facing new calls to step down and causing a split on the editorial board at the university's student newspaper. And as we go to break, we wish everyone a happy and healthy new year. Pennsylvania Senator John Fetterman opening up about his mental health struggles. He says he was afraid if he asked for help that it could have ended his political career. I was able to keep myself some in check where it's like I can hold myself together until the election. But that was October 25th and the election was I think November 8th. After the election that's when things actually accelerated and got worse. And at that point I wasn't able to leave bed. Do you think that social media may have made your depression worse at the time? Oh yeah, anybody. It's an, uh, it's an accelerant. Absolutely. I would just warn anybody that social media, I've never noticed anyone to believe that their health, their mental health has been supported by spending any kind of time on social media. Fetterman suffered depression, which he says got worse as he recovered from a 2022 stroke. He checked himself into a mental health facility in February and was discharged the following month. More fallout over the president of one of the country's most prestigious schools. The editorial board of Harvard's student newspaper now split over President Claudine Gay. At least two members breaking with colleagues saying it's time for her to go. Alexandria Hoff live in Washington with more. Good morning, Alex. Good morning, Mike. You know, two things were happening at once for Harvard's president. Claudine Gay was already fighting off allegations of plagiarism last month when she and the president of UPenn, MIT, were hit with that fierce fallout after providing disastrous testimony on Capitol Hill. At that point, Gay had only been on the job for about five months, while UPenn's president, Liz McGill, resigned from her position. Gay did not. But being unable to answer questions about anti-Semitism anti on campus, it did amplify concerns that had been raised over lack of attribution found in some of Gay's academic work. According to the New York Post, within Gay's peer-reviewed journal articles and her Ph.D. dissertation, there are over two dozen documented instances of alleged plagiarism. This weekend, the Harvard Crimson, the university newspaper, revealed that it is indeed split on Gay's future. The editorial board at large stood by the president in an op-ed, writing, quote, We still have faith in our president as a scholar because we regard her plagiarism as limited and unintentional, and because we recognize that a stopgap interim president would bring chaos instead of needed stability. Well, then yesterday, a dissent came from two of the paper's opinion writers. They wrote, quote, Harvard's presidency is no mere empty honor. It is a deeply challenging managerial job with deeply challenging duties, not least of which is navigating national outcry. In each of these respects, Gay has failed. Now, another op-ed came yesterday from an anonymous student member of the Harvard Honor Council accusing the school of holding the president to a very different standard than students who have been accused of plagiarism. Mike. Alexandria Hoff, thanks very much. Sure. Do you uh, agree with some of the Republicans, even Chris Christie, for example, who argue that taking him off the ballot or at least trying to makes Donald Trump a martyr? Of course. Look, if, if there was any validity about keeping Trump off a ballot, you'd see 48 other states trying to do the same thing. This, personally, I think this was very politically motivated by the main secretary of state. Trump should be on the ballot. That is New Hampshire's Republican Governor Chris Sununu, who endorsed Nikki Haley for the GOP presidential nomination. He is among the latest to scold efforts to remove Donald Trump from state primary ballots. And it is not just Republicans. A growing number of prominent Democrats say banning Trump is unconstitutional and it will backfire. So what are the implications of denying Americans the right to vote for a leading candidate in the race? Rich Zioli, the host of The Rich Zioli Show, joins me right now to talk about this. You know, it, it is pretty fascinating uh, because there's been a, a lot of critique of this uh, coming from both sides of the aisle now. But the Wall Street Journal editorial says this. This week's huge in-kind contribution to Donald Trump's re-election campaign is from the main secretary of state, Shana Bellows, kind of implying what we have seen when he's been charged with crimes. You know, his poll numbers only go up. Your thoughts? Well, Happy New Year, Molly. It, it absolutely is an in-kind contribution to Donald Trump because this only helps him, obviously, 
Uh, Democrats are playing with fire here. You know, they think he's the easy one to beat, and they keep doing things to help him get the nomination. And they are playing with fire because I think whoever the Republican is is going to win the presidency in the general election if things continue down the path they are with the economy. Democrats think he's, a, he's going to lose. He's a, he's a sure bet to lose. And they are making a huge, huge gamble that's going to backfire in their face. And remember, the legal reasoning here is completely not valid. It's just they're making this up as they go along. The Supreme Court is never going to stand by this. No way. So all they're doing is just helping Trump get the nomination. I mean, at this point, it's almost like you can say he's the de facto nominee unless something crazy happens, and Democrats can thank themselves for this. Yeah, one of the really interesting things about Maine is that they split their electoral college votes, and President Trump won one electoral college vote in the last two elections, 2016 to 2020, so this would actually set him back an electoral vote. It could actually have a real consequence in the election. And even there on the ground in Maine, representatives like Representative Jared Golden, a Democrat, says, I voted to impeach Donald Trump for his role in the January 6th insurrection. I do not believe he should be reelected to the president of the United States. However, we're a nation of laws. Therefore, until he's actually found guilty of the crime of insurrection, he should be allowed on the ballot. Your thoughts about this, really, even Democrats coming to the fence on this issue. Yeah, and look, I wouldn't be surprised, Molly, if the special counsel, Jack Smith, who I think is an unconstitutional special counsel, decides to add those charges against Donald Trump going down as we continue down this path. But uh, Democrats sound like absolute hypocrites because they keep screaming about democracies in danger, and then they take the leading Republican nominee off the ballot, and they deny millions of people the right to vote for him as they scream, you know, hair on fire, the republic's crumbling, democracy is dead, and Donald Trump's going to destroy it, and they're actually doing those things. But I don't think this will survive in court for the general election. Absolutely not. I think the Supreme Court's going to laugh at this entire thing and say, look, Section 14, the 14th Amendment, Section 3, specifically does not mention the president for a reason, and it was in the original draft. They took it out, so the intention was to not include the president. This will not survive in the general election. He'll wind up being the nominee. But, you know, Democrats, it's, once again, it's, it's just take away the choice from the voters, take away the choice from you and I, Molly, and then they decide for us. People don't like this. Democrats don't like this. Nobody likes to be denied the right to make a choice. Nobody likes this. All right. It is a new year. A lot of people making New Year's resolutions. Here's President Trump uh, on that issue. Or, I'm sorry, President Biden on that issue. So he says, we'll be back next year. I wasn't entirely sure what he meant about that. Uh, but, you know, does it mean he really likes where they were on vacation there in the tropical location? Or, or is it about the election that he wants to get back out there and, and win the next election? Your thoughts on kind of that uh, a very short little statement on his, on his way as his vacation is wrapping? You know, Molly, I have to wonder, is the biggest state that Joe Biden's staying at in St. Croix, is that worth more than Mar-a-Lago was valued at? I'm, I'm just curious, you know, because I think, well, Mar-a-Lago was valued at, what, $9 million? I think this house is worth something like $40 million. Also, the guy who owns it, big media guy, you know what I mean? Well, Biden is once again showing how completely out of touch he is. And is he really even running for re-election? He's down in St. Croix. Last time I checked, there's not a lot of electoral votes in St. Croix in the U.S. Virgin Islands. He's not even pretending to hit the campaign trail. So so for Joe Biden doing a pre-recorded interview with Ryan Seacrest, it just sounded so robotic last night. And, you know, luckily nobody was really paying attention to it. But this is going to be a year for Democrats to have to ask this honest question. Do they really want Joe Biden to be their nominee? Do they really want this guy to be on the ballot? Because as bad as he is right now, Molly, it's only going to get worse. And if he's got a debate on a general election stage this coming fall, it is not going to go well for him. That's why I think so many Democrats right now are turning around and saying, we got to do something. It's why people like David Axelrod are coming mm -hmm. out there and saying, this guy can't win. You've got Bill Maher saying it. You've got all these other Obama people coming out now and saying, Joe Biden can't win. They don't know what to do. They're stuck because of Kamala Harris, but they know that he is a disaster in the making, and they're really worried about this in 2024. We are they should off be. to the races. Yes, we are definitely off to the races here. Just a few weeks ago, the Iowa caucus is right around the corner, followed by New Hampshire. Thank you, Rich Lilly. We really appreciate your insight, and Happy New Year. Happy New Year, Molly. Thank you. Fox News alert. More bad news for President Biden to start the new year. Brand new numbers coming in this morning on the number of illegal immigrants crossing over our southern border. Plus, a powerful earthquake off the coast of Japan triggering tsunami alerts. We are live with a look at the destruction. Brett, 
out of North Korea. Dictator Kim Jong-un telling the country's military commanders to be ready to destroy the U.S. and South Korea if they choose military confrontation. That, according to state media, Kim saying, quote, our army should deal a deadly blow to thoroughly annihilate them by mobilizing all the toughest means and potentialities without moment's hesitation. Kim Jong-un also says he's no longer interested in reunification with South Korea. Pyongyang has announced plans to launch more spy satellites this year, and analysts expect more weapons tests ahead of the U.S. presidential election. Wow, massive waves causing a weekend of coastal flooding in Southern California. This is what it looked like yesterday in San Diego. Some of the waves topping 30 feet. The weather forced officials to shut down beaches. The choppy surf triggered by a series of violent storms in the Pacific. Back-to-back -back earthquakes threaten Japan. The strong... New record highs as we usher in 2024. Border Patrol sources tell Fox News there were 302,000 migrant encounters last month. That is the highest monthly total ever. And since October 1st, agents have deported 139 suspected terrorists. That's more than double the previous high. The number of known gotaways topping 83,000. Let's bring in Sheriff Mark Daniels from Cochise County, Arizona. Sheriff, good morning. Good morning, Mike. Thanks for having me. Well, sir, let me get your reaction to that number. 302,000 migrant encounters during the month of December, according to CBP sources. Your thoughts? Well, Mike, if you look at this in a business model, you know, you look at President Biden's business model to open up this border. He's done a very successful job. He truly has. The numbers show it every month. Those are non-political numbers. Those are a return for what he's trying to do on this, this open border. Uh, and we're seeing the tragedies every day. We're seeing death on the migrants, which nobody talks about. We're seeing the fentanyl at record numbers, the drugs, illicit drugs come across, the terrorists uh, coming to our country. And then you see the economic impact that we're seeing. It's just not a, no matter what box you look at, Mike, there's not a box you're going to check that's successful right now. Let's show the border numbers under Biden versus Trump. Fiscal year 2023, 2.47 million southern border encounters and ICE conducted 142,580 deportations. In former President Trump's worst year at the border, fiscal year 19, 851,508 encounters and ICE deported 267,258 people. What about that contrast, Sheriff? Well, Mike, that's why your Border Patrol CBP agents are so frustrated. They went from doing their job to being set aside and being processing, being administrative staff. Think about something I think is really important. President Biden, Vice President Harris, who's the border czar, or Secretary Mayorkas have never called this a crisis. In fact, just the opposite. They've said this border is effectively secured. Again, it goes back to the feel-good script that they put out there to the American people. While we're seeing the tragedies, we're seeing what's actually going on this border, the reality of this border. 2024 has to be a change. If we don't see a change and elections have consequences, this is no better time to see that than now when it comes to elections and people getting in touch with that. Then there's this headline from Fox, Iranian national with terror ties caught crossing U.S. northern border illegally. What about those national security concerns? Well, Mike, we're seeing it every day. You look at the numbers you just put up there. They're almost double from what we've seen in the past. And it's not going to get better. And that's what we know. Think about what we don't know when it comes to the Godaway numbers. The people come in the country, I believe it's 1.5 million under this administration, now 1.6 million Godaways. People that have entered the country because they can't run the law enforcement and be arrested or apprehended, however we're term going to use. So these are scary numbers. And what's I would remind everyone, my American uh, colleagues out there, friends, is the fact that let's never forget 9-11. We're living in global unrest right now. We need to secure our country's borders, all the borders, and leaving them open right now is leaving every American vulnerable. Sheriff Mark Daniels from Cochise County, Arizona, thank you so much for your time. Our best to you and the men and women on the front lines there in this new year. Happy New Year. Thank you. Happy New Year, Mike. Thank you to everybody at Fox. Molly? 
And the fentanyl crisis taking a heavy toll on one Kentucky town. What is driving the dramatic spike in overdoses? Plus, Democrats had a busy year declaring war on appliances. Vice President Harris getting burned online for posing with a gas stove after her administration tried to ban them. And they're not done yet. You will not believe the long list. What is coming up next? Barry, and it emerged from an even more giant toaster going viral before anyone could come close to finishing the whole thing. Bowl officials po posting this, quote, leave no crumbs. And, you know, after running around the football field, good for those guys. Dog the Pop-Tart. Have a good time. Right? I think all mascots should be edible. This should be the new thing. Everything should be food-themed. I went to Virginia Tech. We've got the hokey bird, you know, gobble, gobble. Although I sure. don't know that you have to do it live on the field right after the game. It's just maybe but a little disturbing. I think disturbing. like a pizza <laughs> sponsor could do a mega pizza, or maybe in Philly they do a giant cheesesteak bowl Ooh, or something. There you go. Yep. Dive into some chowder in Boston. It's going to be exactly awesome. Exactly right. See, this is a whole new world. Let's do it. <laughs> All yeah. right. Uh, the Biden administration is quietly rolling out some new environmental regulations targeting more popular home commercial appliances. This time, refrigerators and freezers, federal officials say, will help curb carbon emissions. Phil Flynn, Fox Business contributor and senior analyst for Price Futures Group, joins me to talk about this. This is pretty interesting because, you know, initially it seemed like they were going after the kitchen. Now it's the whole house. You know, we've got uh, the uh, gas stoves was first. Now we've got clothes washers and refrigerators. Standards for air conditioners came out in March. Proposed rules for dishwashers in May, heaters in July, furnaces in September because, you know, it's starting to get cold. Your thoughts on the rollout of these new regulations? I, th I think you have to beware of the rise of the green energy industrial complex because they're coming after every aspect of your life, Molly. Molly, I, you know, I, I hope everybody can get a big toaster to get one of those big uh, pop tarts because you know they really want to control not only what you can eat, how you can cook it, how you can get it, uh, and, and it's a real danger because when we look at these regulations, they're going to have little impact on the environment, helping things out, making things better but they're going to have a major impact on the way you live you, it, it, and your ability to make money uh, and uh, the economy. Yeah, you know, the Energy Secretary, Jennifer Granholm, argues that this is a testament to the administration's commitment to lowering utility costs for working families. But this Ben Lieberman, a senior fellow at the Competitive Enterprise Institute, said to Fox News Digital, consumers are perfectly capable of making these decisions on their own, including consumers who want to buy extra efficient refrigerators or other models. What these standards do is force that choice on everyone, whether it makes sense for them or not. Is this about choice or should it be? It should be about choice. And, and the government is historically horrible when they try to dictate how things should be made, whether it be refrigerators or, or ice cream makers or cars, it's always a disaster. You know, and when we talk about, you know, forcing people into more efficient um, you know, refrigerators and furnaces, what that means, it's going to make the cost of housing that's already through the roof more expensive. People aren't going to be able to afford these things. So they're going to either have less efficiency or they're going to go without. You know, take a look at the electric car situation. They're trying to force everybody to buy electric cars, but they don't think of the long-term impact on the environment. A lot of these electric cars are ending up in, uh, you know, junk heaps uh, with uh, toxic batteries that have no way to be recycled. So I don't think they think these things through, but that's the government. They never do. You know, wh what does this mean for manufacturers facing, you know, a new regulatory framework? I think what it does, it makes it harder for them to produce goods cheaply. Uh, they're going to make them more efficiently. And, and to be honest with you, they're going to put out a worse product. You know, let manufacturers do what they do best. That's build products, do them more efficiently. They're already on the road to making more efficient products. You know, work with the industry. Don't work against them. But that's what this administration continues to do. You know, Kamala Harris, the vice president, of course, got roasted, burned, baked. So many puns we could use here. Uh, when she put out for Christmas, and uh, you know, the, her holiday message, once again, in front of what appears to be a gas stove. They did this at Thanksgiving as well. And this coming, of course, in the wake of the attempted regulations to, to uh, cramp down on the gas stoves. You know, is it hypocrisy? Is it kind of a rules for me, not for thee? Or is this just, I mean, trolling at this point? It is 
absolute hypocrisy. And, and you can look at it. I mean, look at the biggest green energy global movement in the world, uh, the COP28 uh, that was in Dubai. All these world leaders flying in their private jets, you know, to, to, to save the planet. And it definitely is more about controlling the small people, giving the power to the elites, you know, and making it you know, more difficult for you to not only make a living, but to, to just trans, transform yourself or keep your house warm. It's just absolute ludicrousness. And it's really about control. It's not about saving the environment. All right. Phil Flynn, thank you so much uh, for joining us on this first day of the new year. Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year, Molly. Mike. Ravishing small communities in rural.